Oh, uh, what to do about this video? <sighs> do I film it? Don't I film it? Do I post it? Do I not post it? Half of the friends and family that I speak to say yes, do post it because more people need to be aware about it and talk about it. And then the other half of the people that I speak to say no, don't post it because it's way too embarrassing and just not something that you should put out there onto the internet. I have to explain some of this. Otherwise, anyone who watches any of my other videos, you'll see that some of the things just won't make sense unless you realize that I've had this let's procedure done. I do kind of need to address it. I kind of need to explain. But also I just thought that if this encourages people to go for their smear test, even if this encourages just one more person to go and book their smear test, I've done a good thing. People do put off their smear tests. People don't realize the importance of it. And the more that people speak about it it would normalize a bit more i know that for me once i started talking about this with my friends hearing their experiences i realized firstly that i'm not alone i'm not the only person who experienced this and secondly hearing that they had been through similar things actually reassured me because then i had more of an understanding of what the process was going to be like okay so if you're seeing this video then i have been brave enough to post it and to talk about my experience my one request <laughs> actually i've got two requests my first request is please, please be kind. Be kind not only to me, because this is a huge thing to share and to put online and to put on the internet, to put out there for everyone to know about, but also please be kind to each other in the comments. If anyone does choose to leave a comment about their experience as well, or share their experience with this, I would like this to be a place where we can all just be really kind and supportive to each other. My other request, and this is particularly for any guys watching, because there will be a lot of TMI chat here. Just as a pre-warning before we delve into the video, we will be talking about women's health, vaginas, bleeding. And so if that's not for you and you don't want to watch that, that's completely fine because it's embarrassing enough for me to put this out there anyway. If you don't want to watch this video, I'm not offended. If you don't watch any of the rest of this video, please take away how important it is to have a smear test. So anyone that you know um, with female anatomy, encourage them to go and get their smear test. It can potentially save someone's life. If you don't watch any more of this video, just take away this message. And I know so many people who haven't been for their regular smear tests. Once I got my result from mine and I started talking to people, I was amazed the amount of my friends who were like, oh God, I haven't been for my smear test. Or like, oh, my smear test was due. Like five years ago, but I just haven't been. I know it's not nice, I know it's not pleasant, and it's not the most comfortable thing in the world, and you're like completely exposing your vagina to someone else. A couple of minutes of your life, and then it's done. Those couple of minutes could save your life. For me, had I not have gone to my smear test when I did, if I'd have just waited and put it off and put it off, by the time I'd have actually gone, if I'd left it five years, this could be a completely different story that I'm telling right now. I went from nothing to sin three in one year. So if I'd have left that even longer, well, the next stage after Sin 3 is cancer, so. But anyone who wants to continue watching, then let's get into it. Okay, so about a year ago, I went for my routine cervical smear test on the NHS. It had been three years since I'd had my last one, which was normal. And from this smear test, I then had to go and have a colposcopy. A colposcopy is similar to when you go for your smear test, only a bit more detailed, and they take a closer look at your cervix. We'll go into that a little bit in detail later on in the video. My smear test come back up normal. I go for this colposcopy. A doctor looks closely at my cervix and says, no, nope, actually everything looks fine here. We don't need to do anything today. What I would suggest is just have a follow-up smear test in a year. No biopsies were taken. There was no talk about SIN 1, 2 or 3. Just everything looks fine on my check today. Come back in a year just to be sure. Off I go, not thinking anything more about it. And then a year goes by, and in March of this year, I had my follow-up smear test. So a year on from when the doctor told me before to go and have one done. Went along, had my smear test, all seemed fine. Off I went afterwards. The nurse who did my smear test just said, you'll receive a letter in the post of your result. That will be that, basically. Didn't say anything that my cervix looked abnormal. Um, didn't ask me any funny questions. I had no reason to sort of think that anything was wrong at this point. Then after about six weeks, I hadn't heard anything. I hadn't had any results. And I thought that was a bit strange because all the previous times when I've had my smear tests, about two weeks later, I get a letter from my GP to say, your screening was normal. Or in the case of the previous year, your screening was abnormal. 
you need the colposcopy. And we got to about the six week mark and I hadn't heard anything. I decided to ring my GP surgery just to see what was going on and just to check, like, is everything okay? Do I need to be worried? Why haven't I heard from my results, basically? They said that there wasn't a problem, just that all the lab techs had been on strike recently, so there was no one to process the samples. It didn't make me think that anything was abnormal, just, yeah, there'd been a strike and there was no one to run the samples, basically. That's not great, because if something was really, really wrong, then that really delays your treatment, but. Cut to about a week later, I'm at work and my phone goes off, my phone starts ringing with a number that I didn't recognise and I do get quite a lot of hoax calls and sometimes I like to answer them just to wind the person up who's on the other end who's trying to sell me some kind of rubbish for the day. When I answer my phone, it was some woman calling from a hospital that I'd never heard of before telling me that she'd booked me in for my urgent colposcopy appointment and I was like, sorry, what? I haven't even had the results back from my smear test yet, I don't know like in the nice way possible, I don't know what you're going on about. I don't know this hospital, I don't know who you are, I haven't had the results from my smear test. You're saying to me it's urgent. She was calling me because she'd already booked me an appointment in. So they called me on the 12th of May and she had booked me an appointment for the 16th of May. I do shift work and even if I didn't work shift work, the 16th was like a weekday. It's very short notice for someone to be able to take the time off work to go for one of these appointments. I said to her, I was like, I'm at work at the moment. I I'm meant to have work that day that you want me to come in for this urgent colposcopy um, but I'll have to speak to my manager and see if she can sort my shifts with me. Went and spoke to my manager and well did they give me the time off? No, nope, not a chance. I called the woman back and I was like look I'm really sorry but work can't give me this time off and she was like you don't understand this is really urgent we need to see you we have to see you by the 19th. Well you've called me on the 12th so the 19th isn't that far away. That doesn't give many days to see me and I don't know the way that she was talking just made me really panicky the way she was like it's really urgent we have to see you by the 19th anyway then she was like when's your next day off so she was like okay well we have to see you that day so she booked me in that appointment every day until that appointment she rang me to confirm that i was still coming for the appointment and that made me feel really anxious about it the fact that she'd used words like urgent colposcopy on the phone she was so desperate to see me in the next few days and then she was ringing me every day to check that i was going in that really kind of set the ball rolling for me feeling anxious about the whole thing and i'm not a good patient anyway i'm really not at this point i still hadn't heard from my gp surgery with my result so I still had no idea what was going on. The next day I received a confirmation letter of my appointment along with a letter from the cervical screening program. I received this letter to say that I had HPV, high grade dyscariosis. I hope I've said that right. And then in brackets next to it, it said brackets severe. Again, that made me feel anxious because well, suddenly I've got this letter that says I've got a severe cell change. Here's where we get to the nice awkward bit, HPV. HPV is the name for a very common group of viruses. Most people will get HPV at some point in their lives. And around 50% of HPV infection involves certain high-risk strains of HPV that can cause cancer. Because of HPV being transmitted sexually, it does still have such a huge stigma. But so many people have it. So many. Apparently, 8 in 10 people will have HPV at some point in their lives. It usually doesn't cause any symptoms. And most people will never know that they've had it. Because as women or people who have a cervix, we get screened. We generally tend to know if we've got it because it gets picked up on screening. But otherwise, most people will never know that they've had it. Most of the time, the body clears HPV and it doesn't lead to cancer. And this is why I was so, like... Do I put this video up? Don't I put this video up? I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not the only one. I know there's actually so many people. And if you're watching this, you do not have to leave a comment to say that you've got it. From speaking to my friends and family, I know of lots of people who've got it, had it, whatever. So I know I'm not alone. And that gives me some comfort in putting this video up. That's where we get the huge stigma from around it all. But I feel like that really, really needs to be broken down. Anyone who's ever had sex may have been exposed to HPV. HPV doesn't usually cause any symptoms and this is why cervical screening is so important because if you get one of these strains of HPV that can cause cancerous cell changes, one of the only ways you're really gonna know is by having your cervical screening. For me, I didn't have any symptoms that anything was wrong. So then I went to go and have the colposcopy done. And a colposcopy is a test to have a look at the cervix in more detail. In the room I had with me, I went with my sister because I was so stressed and anxious, I wanted someone to come with me. And I knew that she'd be really good for me at this appointment. So she came along with me. I then had the woman who was performing the colposcopy. She had a nurse and there was also a care assistant. And then there was also a student midwife. It would have been my preference not to have so many people in the room, but I knew that everyone was there for a reason. 
and also with student midwives. I've been a student midwife myself and I know how valuable these experiences can be. And then most of the appointment to me was a bit of a blur. You go in, you sit on this, uh, it's like a specially designed chair so you can put your feet up. If you're going for a colposcopy and you don't want to wear a hospital gown because for me, being a really anxious, nervous patient, wearing a hospital gown is a huge trigger for me because it just makes me feel more stressed and more like the patient. So if you want to avoid wearing a hospital gown for your colposcopy, wear a skirt or a dress. So I wore a dress so that I knew that then I can just hike it up and I wouldn't have to put on a gown. It was easier for the doctor to get to where they needed to get to, if that makes sense. Then you go and sit in this weird funky chair. During the colposcopy, they insert a speculum into your vagina again. Then a microscope is used to look at your cervix in greater detail, but the microscope stays outside of your body. It doesn't ever actually go into your vagina. By looking through it, they can see changes that may be too small for us to just see with a normal naked eye. Normally, people say the appointment takes about 15 to 20 minutes. I don't actually know how long mine took because it was all such a blur and I was so stressed throughout the whole thing. Oh God, I don't even know how long I was in there for. I just remember my legs were so shaky. I felt like I couldn't breathe. At one point, I was nearly sick on the woman's head because obviously she was like right in between my legs. They also have a screen up while you have it done of what they're seeing with the the magnifying glass. I couldn't look at that because I just felt too ill. During the colposcopy, she then told me that she had seen um, abnormal changes and she wanted to take a biopsy. This terrified me. When she said it, she said, I need to take a biopsy. I mean, to be honest, you don't really have much choice. Well, you do have a choice. You could probably say no to having the biopsy done, but the biopsy is gonna be sent to the lab for more intense screening to see what kind of cell changes do you have and do you potentially have cervical cancer? So obviously I wasn't gonna say no, but I wasn't happy about it. The speculum itself didn't hurt, it just felt uncomfortable. And it's more the feeling of like, you just feel so vulnerable because you know that someone's right by your vagina. It's more just uncomfortable rather than painful. But then the biopsy, which is probably about the size of like, I don't know, a tiny little dot. She asked me to cough and then I felt this, how do I describe it? Like a, a pinch and a tug from somewhere really deep within that I can't even describe where it is. And that made me feel so sick. And then the colposcopy was over <laughs> and she sat me down. At that point I was feeling quite faint and I wasn't really feeling with it. And I was feeling so stressed about the whole appointment. Like my legs were shaking. I'd obviously felt really sick throughout the whole thing. Afterwards, you should feel well enough to go home. The first time I had a colposcopy done, I fainted a few times. So they did keep me there for a little bit. This time around, I didn't actually faint, which for me is a bit of a miracle, but it wasn't a pleasant experience for me. The thought of it now gives me like sweaty palms and makes me feel stressed. Afterwards, I remember her saying that she had seen changes, um, but she wasn't sure. And she kept saying, we need to prepare you for whatever the news might be. You kind of latch on to these words that healthcare professionals use. And so when she was saying things like, we need to prepare you for any news, I was just like, well, she's seen something then, she's just not telling me. She did show me a picture of what my cervix looked like. So I will insert that now so you can have a look for anyone who is interested what a cervix with, it turned out to be Syn3, and what a cervix with Syn3 looks like. Yeah, you can see the area of cell change that she was worried about. Um, so they put this dye on your cervix and any cell changes kind of light up a little bit with this die. She'd obviously seen this whole area that had lit up, but that was the area that she was concerned about. She told me that I would need to have further treatment to get rid of the abnormal cells, and this is known as LETS. LETS stands for Large Loop Excision of the Transformation Zone. Basically a procedure where they remove the abnormal cells from your cervix. It's where a wire loop, which is heated by an electrical current, is used to remove the abnormal cells. If you can tolerate it, and if the person who's doing your colposcopy um, feels that they can do it, sometimes they do it there and then. Sometimes you do have to wait for the biopsy result and then come back and have it done. You can have this procedure done with just a local anesthetic injected into your cervix and have it done while you're awake, have the surgery, and then you're good to go home. I did not tolerate the colposcopy at all. It was a horrendous experience for me, most likely for the doctor who was doing it um, and for everyone involved. And also because of the situation that I was in and with having SYN3 and and the area of cells that she saw as being abnormal, I was recommended to have this treatment under a general anaesthetic. In many ways I was relieved because I knew that I didn't tolerate the colposcopy well enough and I wanted to be um, completely like out of it, asleep, not aware when I had the LETS procedure done. I didn't want to be able to 
see anything or just like know anything about it. So to know that I could have a general anesthetic was really, really reassuring. She said that it was more than likely that I would need this procedure and she wouldn't put it off or wait. And then a device for after your colposcopy, they say you can expect some light bleeding and some sort of, it was kind of like brownie discharge, to be honest. Guess from the stuff that they use to clean the cervix and also to highlight the abnormal cells. I had about sort of five days worth of bleeding afterwards, but it wasn't anything major. Then I went home and then I had to wait for the results of the biopsy. The next day I get a phone call and it was the woman who'd done my colposcopy calling me to tell me that she had phoned the lab and checked with them, had made it to the lab and that she would be contacting them every day to find out my result. And again, this really worried me. A few days later, I get my result and it comes back and it confirms that I have thin three. And this means that the full thickness of the cervical surface layer is affected by abnormal cells. Syn3 is also called carcinoma in situ. And it sounds like cancer, but it's not cancer. Syn3 may become cancer if it's not treated. The things that concern them and obviously me as well is having my colposcopy a year ago and then seeing nothing, not even anything that was worthy of taking a biopsy to a year later, Syn3. That's a huge change. It would go Syn1, Syn2, Syn3. So I'd literally just jumped all the way to sim 3 which is very scary. It does make me wonder, had they have done a biopsy at the first colposcopy I had a year ago, would they have found something? I went online and obviously started looking for things, <laughs> looking for advice, information, other people's experiences. I did watch the video by Sarah's Day about how she naturally healed her sim 3 with vitamins and all kinds of stuff like that, which is great and amazing for her. And if she felt confident and comfortable to do that, then absolutely fantastic. Personally, that wasn't the appropriate route to take. I was very fearful of it turning into cancer. I feel like the doctors, they weren't as lenient with giving me time. They wanted to just kind of get on with things. I'm not really sure what they saw that may have been different to someone else, someone who maybe someone that they would have let try and heal themselves naturally for six months. For me, that was not an option. The doctors wanted to go straight for the surgery to remove the bad cells. And to be honest, the kind of person that I am, if I know that something is wrong, I just want to get it done right now. And I'm not saying that it's a bad option if that's what's suitable for you and what's right for you and your doctors are okay with it and you're happy with that, then that's great. That just wasn't something that I wanted to try. I was then booked in for my surgery fairly quickly. Um, it was literally like within a week that they booked me in. Again, work weren't best please. I had been given a day off for the surgery and then a day off after and then back into work for the next two days in a row. When I spoke to my doctor, he did actually sign me off for a week because he said, especially with having a general anaesthetic anyway, whenever you've had a general anaesthetic, you should have a week off work. I had to go in a couple of days before to have pre-op. I had an MRSA swab taken um, from my nose and the crease of my groin. They also checked my bloods to check that my iron levels were okay. I went and had that done a couple of days before and that all seemed fine. And at that point, I was feeling a little bit nervous about the surgery, but not majorly. And then the only thing that I was really don't want is I didn't want to have to stay in overnight, which they did tell me is quite unusual, but I did need someone to pick me up on the day of the surgery. And if I didn't have anyone to pick me up and stay with me at home, I would have to stay in overnight. And this worried me because at the time when all this was going on, Zav was in France. So I was in the house by myself. And I think my were my parents away at this point or were they going away? They might have been going away to go and see my sister. Oh, I, I can't remember, but there was some reason why my parents couldn't be with me. Basically, I would have had to stay overnight in the hospital and that was really stressing me out. Luckily, I have two amazing friends, Molly and Izzy, who Molly came and picked me up from the hospital to go home and then the pair of them stayed with me my first night and day after the surgery. And if it weren't for them, I would probably have had to stay in the hospital. I had my pre-op bloods, I had my MRSA screen, which all came back as absolutely fine. And then came the day of the surgery. I was on the PM list for the surgery. I was told to arrive at the hospital for 12 o'clock. I wasn't allowed to eat anything from 10 p.m. the night before, and I was allowed water up until 6 a.m. Um, the morning of the surgery. I did pack a hospital bag just in case, but also, like I've said before, I'm a really anxious patient and I was nervous that something would happen and I'd have to stay overnight anyway. Got my little bag, my big bag. I want to be prepared, you know? Can you actually bring slippers? Yeah. It's like 30 degrees. 
No, I've got my flip-flops well, but we'll see. I don't you know. and scabby toes. Well, I wasn't allowed Look to wear... Them turning left. I know, I've got these weird bendy toes. <laughs> they do look really weird there, but I wasn't allowed to wear any nail polish, they told me. Ew, what are those? <laughs> right. Look at them, Alice. Good luck. Now. Love you too, thank you. I was checked in and then I was shown to my cubicle. I was expecting it to be bays of like rows of beds and then just a curtain, but I was actually shown to a really lovely, um, it was almost like a cubicle. It was really spacious actually. It was clean, it was comfortable. The staff were really friendly. It had a lovely nurse. I wasn't allowed to wear any jewelry or any makeup um, and I wasn't allowed to have any nail varnish on my hands or my feet. I was given a wristband with my details on and then I was also given a like a hospital gown to wear. Under the gown, I wasn't allowed to wear any bra or any pants. Felt kind of naked and a bit exposed. I literally just had just a hospital gown on. This is gonna sound like I'm always having periods. My cycle was just crazy and all over the place, but I was on my period for this appointment. Really annoying. So I did actually keep my pants on uh, just until I was called to go down to theatre because I wasn't allowed to use a tampon or anything because obviously the doctor is going to like look up there they don't want there to be something there so I just had a little pad on and I didn't want to just be like completely naked I had my blood pressure taken, my pulse, my temperature and they took a urine sample just to um, rule out any pregnancies the consultant came round, he spoke to me about the procedure, what's involved that he would uh, do the lets, that he also wanted to take three more biopsies he got me to sign a consent form he talked to me about the risks of surgery, so like infection, bleeding, and the risk that they can't get all the abnormal cells. And then my anaesthetist came round again, just to take a medical history, check I had no allergies. I have had a general anaesthetic before, and even though I've had a general anaesthetic before, I was so nervous about dying. Um, from the anaesthetic. And I don't know if this is a common thing. I don't know if anyone else has this, but just the thought for the few days leading up to it, I was always convinced I was gonna die. I was like, I'm gonna have this surgery. I'm gonna be put to sleep. I'm gonna have a general anaesthetic. I'm never gonna wake up and that's gonna be it. I've been having nightmares about it before going in. So when the anaesthetist came round, he was like, do you have any worries? He was like, uh, you're not gonna die. He was like, everything will be fine. Basically reassured me and he was like, it's my job to check that you know, you're still breathing and that everything is okay. He was like, I promise I will look after you. Even more than the fact that I had these abnormal cells and that they could be cancerous, I was more worried about the fact that I was having a GA and that I could have died from that. Anyway, I was then told I was third on the list, so I had a bit of a weight in my hands. I took a clean Hoover book with me, which was, it was a great book, but, I actually couldn't focus on it when I was in the hospital waiting for the operation because I was just so nervous. As much as that was a good book, it wasn't a very good distraction at that point. I actually read that um, a couple days after when I was just recovering at home. I also watched a bit of Love Island. Shit TV makes for a great distraction. Um, I'm actually really enjoying this year's Love Island. Uh, please don't come for me in the comments. No judgment, okay? It's a guilty pleasure. I'm sure we've all got them. I watched that, I caught up on that to um, distract me. I thought I was gonna have a little sleep because I didn't really sleep much the night before because I was so worried. Oh, Oh God, I just felt so stressed. I couldn't sleep. Oh, scared about everything. And then I started thinking about having the cannula and then being put to sleep and then, oh God. It was a stressful wait, okay? Being third on the list is not fun because you've got longer to wait. And also you see everyone else going off. I, I wasn't the last one. There was someone else after me as well. So bless her, like she had to wait even longer. The reassuring thing, I guess, one of my sisters is a nurse and she said to me, later on the list, it means you're a less complicated case because they're gonna do the more complicated cases first. So that was a little bit reassuring to know that. But also I had been fasted from 10 o'clock the night before. I had had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. Oh my God, my belly was like going crazy. At one point the nurse did come around and she was like, the doctor has said because it's 30 degrees outside today, if you want to have small sips of water, you can. I was so terrified of dying from the GA that I just didn't even want to risk it. I didn't even um, touch a bit of water. Luckily they had aircon. Yeah, I just was so nervous to have anything. So I just didn't. Eventually it was my turn and a porter came to come and pick me up and take me to theater. And it was really weird because I obviously felt fine. That's the weird thing throughout the whole of this is I've never, had any symptoms I've always felt completely fine completely normal and I obviously felt well and the porter came over to come and get me and he was like um excuse me miss like we need to take you on the bed and I was like oh but I can walk I can just walk there and he was like no it's actually hospital procedure we we have to take you around on the bed I don't know that just felt really weird obviously I had to remove my underwear with this gown over me which we all know hospital gowns they're loose they're gapy lying on this bed 
not feeling ill, naked under this like hospital gown and one sheet, wheeled around the hospital. And it was so weird to kind of have this perspective of lying in the bed and seeing my feet wheeling around the hospital. I just can't explain it. Then they wheeled me through the theatre doors and I could just see from my feet like going through the theatre doors into the operating theatre with all like the stuff around. It was just a really weird experience because when I've been in theatre previously, I mean, I've only had one operation previously, but I was already under anaesthetic before I was taken into the theatre. There were a lot of people in theatre and a lot of people kept coming into theatre. I had this lovely nurse holding my hand on one side and then the anaesthetist putting my cannula in the other side. A cannula is like a small plastic tube that is placed into your vein to be able to give you drugs and fluids directly into your vein basically. A little needle is used to insert it and then the needle is removed and the little plastic tube remains. I'm terrified of needles. I'm extremely needle phobic. I'm a medical professional myself. I'm needle phobic. I can take anyone's blood but if it's me, hell no, take that needle away. And then they put a face mask over my nose and my mouth like a clear um, breathing mask and they were trying to get me to breathe with this mask. I just felt so much pain going down my arm where they were giving me the drugs for the general anaesthetic. And I just kept trying to lift my arm up and saying, my arm is so painful. When I tell you it's painful, I felt burning up inside my arm. And the anaesthetist did say, he said something about it. And then he said, just try and relax. Just try and let go. Cause like my legs were shaking, my breathing was funny. And they were like, you need to just relax. And I remember more people coming into the theater and I was like trying to fight this anaesthetic. And I was saying to the nurse, there's so many people coming in here and they're all gonna see my and then I remember the nurse just trying to say to me, why don't you talk to me about what holidays you've got planned this summer? Next thing you know, bam. And then I'm in recovery. It's the weirdest feeling. I don't even know how to explain it to you. How one minute you're there, you're awake, you're chatting, you're aware of what's going on around you. And then all of a sudden you're in a different place. You don't dream. You don't, you know, like sometimes when you close your eyes, if it's dark, it will just be like black. Or if there's lights, like you get like colors even when your eyes are closed you don't get any of that it's just like one minute you're here the next minute you're there and it's so weird yeah you can't really describe what it feels like i don't know if any of you have had a general anesthetic let me know in the comments below how you would describe it. I remember briefly waking up in recovery and my vision was quite blurry, but I did see a nurse walking around. I think they spoke to me. I remember them calling my name. I was so drowsy, I was so sleepy. I wasn't really with it. I don't remember anything of being wheeled back into my room, cubicle, bay thing where I was. I didn't really have so much of a concept of time at this point, but I don't really remember the first bit of being there. My doctor did come around at some point after the surgery. I remember when I was back on the ward, he did come around to see me and he talked about how much of my cervix he'd taken away. I knew that my friend Molly was there. She'd come to pick me up. As you can see, I was just pretty much out of it. I wasn't really with it for quite a while. Eventually the nurse came around and said that if I weed, I could go home. I was so desperate to go home. I just didn't want to be a patient anymore. I didn't want to be in hospital. I just wanted to be in my own environment. I could not have got off that bed quick enough to go and try and wee. I know I didn't wee enough. I actually don't think I weed at all. I <laughs> think it was just a tiny bit of blood that came out into the pot. I know you're not supposed to let patients go home until they've done a proper good sized wee and I definitely didn't do that. I am peeing normally now and everything is fine. Once I had my cannula out and I'd weed, I was allowed to go home. When I was discharged um, by my nurse, she gave me my sort of aftercare advice. So the recommendation was I could take paracetamol if I wanted to for pain relief. Very luckily and very kindly, Molly and Izzy stayed the first night with me after my surgery. And they stayed with me the next day as well to check that I was feeling okay. I felt generally all right at that point. I just felt really tired. For sort of like the next few days, all I really did was just sleep. I feel like I probably just slept off the anaesthetic. But I did get a bit crampy and I did on off take paracetamol. And then the advice after you've had a let, no sex for four weeks following surgery. You're not allowed to use tampons for four weeks, moon cups or anything that goes into the vagina. You can only wear pads. And in terms of exercise, I was told to avoid any kind of strenuous exercise for the next week. And I was also told that I wasn't allowed to bath, swim or submerge myself in any water for at least four weeks after. This is why when I went to Norway, which was only about two and a bit weeks after the surgery, I wasn't allowed to swim in any of the lakes, unfortunately. You can return to work when you feel well enough. Because I'd had a let's and the biopsy treatment and the fact that I had a general anaesthetic, 
he advised me to at least have a week off work. I went back to work after the week. I was still bleeding, but I did expect that, so I wasn't worried and it wasn't heavy enough that it was causing me any concern. Being back at work was really tough, actually. I didn't realize um, how sort of like drained mentally and physically I would feel from the whole experience. I was just exhausted. If you're watching this point of the video, then I did warn you, it's a lot of TMI. <laughs> this would have really helped me to have been a little bit prepared and to have known a little bit more about what to expect. Bleeding wise, I was told to expect some bleeding after the surgery, or that the bleeding could last for up to four weeks. What I wasn't told or warned about was the amount of bleeding and what the bleeding would be like. That is the bit that I have struggled with the most. Managing the blood loss and wearing pads. That's been one of the hardest bits of the recovery for me. And um, the bleeding that I had from sort of straight away after the surgery over like the next week was quite heavy. It was sort of like as though I was on a heavy period. After about a week, the blood loss started to settle down a bit. Not enough that I couldn't wear a pad, but enough that I didn't need like a huge thick pad. I could just have like a panty liner in. And then on about day nine, bleeding suddenly shot up massively. Just had this like tiny panty liner on. I was just getting ready to go out. And then I was about to leave the house and I felt this huge like gush down below. It felt really weird. Went to the toilet and sure enough, I had like soaked my underwear, soaked my clothes with bright fresh red blood. And that I was a bit like, this is weird because everything had been settling down. Why is this suddenly picked up? And it wasn't like I'd suddenly started doing loads because I'd already been back to work. I hadn't really had the most strenuous day that day. Got changed, put like a normal pad on because I thought, well, if the bleeding's going up a bit, like I... I don't want to have any accidents. Throughout that night, I noticed that my bleeding had got a lot heavier. My pads were just like soaked full. That night, when I got home, I thought I'm going to use thicker pads because like these ones that I've got clearly aren't, like these are like normal pads that you'd wear on your period. But I was like, these clearly aren't going to hold everything. And I don't want to go to sleep and have something happen when I'm asleep. So I got these like huge tenor pads, put one of those in. And then after two hours, I had to go to the bathroom again because it was just soaked through and it was like bright fresh red blood i was like i don't want to bother anyone at this time of night calling anyone i'll go to sleep and i'll think about it in the morning i don't want to go into hospital i'll just wait and see what happens overnight woke up in the morning and obviously i had soaked through that pad and i had ruined my bed sheet the next day the bleeding continued to be heavy through the next day i had some small clots as well because of that i decided to make contact with one of the doctors they reassured me that around day 9 to 11 the bleeding can increase and it's all part of the healing process and they reassured me that it was normal although they said i shouldn't actually have been changing my pads every two hours but it was normal for the bleeding to increase a bit. So they said, keep an eye on it. If I feel like it's still really heavy, then to go into hospital. Otherwise it does pick up a bit around this time of the healing and then it will settle back down again. It had settled a little bit in that I wasn't changing my pad every two hours now. But it was still very heavy and very bright, fresh red. In a few days, I was planning to go to Norway. And so I was starting to get a little bit worried. What I really didn't want was to go to a different country and then have a problem with like bleeding or possible infection or like some Thing being going wrong. I've got travel insurance because you should always get travel insurance anyway. You never know what is going to happen, even if you're completely healthy before you go. Again, the day before we left, I spoke to another doctor and I just explained the situation. It had settled down a little bit and they reassured me that I would be okay to go to Norway. It stayed like that for about sort of the three days before I went away. The day that we flew to Norway, luckily it did start to settle more to like the amount of a heavy period. For the whole time that I was away in Norway, it was like being on a heavy period. At this point, I was now three weeks post-op. I didn't have any pain and I didn't have any temperature, so there were no other causes for concern. I am obviously now back from Norway. Let me check how much post-op I am now. Four weeks post-op in three days, I am still bleeding. Generally, having the lets doesn't affect or alter your periods. Sometimes it can change them slightly. My bleeding has sort of just rolled into the next period. Oh, God knows how much blood I've lost at this point. Now I'm not sure because I'm on my period. And I know I'm on my period now because it's painful. I've got period pains. I'm not sure at this point what is from the operation and what is just my period. One of my friends was talking about her experience having a let's done and she said a few weeks later, you know, just make sure that even if the blood loss settles, like you're still wearing pads because um, one day you'll get a surprise and it will be like 
there's been a barbecue in your pants. I was like, what do you mean, like a barbecue in my pants? She was like, yeah, you'll get all these black bits, which is basically the scab of everything having healed. Oh, gross. Either I'm not at that point yet, or that point has happened and I just haven't noticed. <laughs> I did go slightly against my advice that I was given and a few days ago, I had a bath. There is nothing I love more than soaking in water. I am a huge lover of baths. I have a headache, I have a bath, it fixes it. I feel like I'm getting cold, I have a bath and it fixes it. If I'm on my period, bath, backache, bath. I love a bath. I am a true Aquarian. I love to be in the water. The water is like where I feel most relaxed. <laughs> and I was feeling so low and fed up the constant bleeding like when it's been weeks and weeks and weeks of bleeding and like having to wear pads and just feeling so uncomfortable all i wanted to do was have a bath i knew the risks i knew i could get an infection i knew that my cervix might not be healed properly at this point for the sake of my mental health like balancing my mental health versus my physical health at that point in time my mental health needed a bit of a boost and yeah i had a bath we're a few days on from that now and i'm still alive to tell the tale so it kind of been that bad. Not that I'm advising that if you've had the same thing, you go and have a bath before you've been told because that was just me taking on my own risks. A couple of days ago, I did also get my final biopsy result back, which I was so nervous for because obviously there was still the chance that um, they were saying it could still be cervical cancer. My result came back as just SIN3. SIN3 is obviously still really bad, it's still not good, but I cannot tell you the relief finding out that you don't have cancer when you've been worrying that that's what it could be. The relief to get back that news that actually it's not that. I cannot tell you how happy I am and how over the moon I am. I just feel really grateful that that wasn't my result and I feel really lucky for that. I've got my checkup next week with the doctor just to check in that everything is looking good and everything is as should be at this point. My next steps are to have my smear test repeated in six months and that is as a test of cure to check that they have got rid of all of the abnormal cells and that there's nothing bad left. Hopefully in six months time, I get a normal smear test result. That is my story of cervical dysplasia, SIN3, having my colposcopy, having my LETS procedure, having it done under a GA, how I felt the experience to be. I cannot explain enough how grateful I am for the NHS in England. It's really weird going from working in the NHS to then using the NHS service as a patient. Can't speak highly enough of the care that I've had and I feel so super grateful for it. If you have watched this video to the end, thank you so much. I hope that you can take something away from this. I think I've covered all bases of what I wanted to say in this video. I'm so sorry if it's a really long one. I just wanted to cram as much information as I could. If there is anything that I have missed out, that I haven't answered, that you do want to know about, my DMs are open. Please either send me a message or if you feel up to it, then put a comment down below. Please just remember, just be kind to each other about this because it is something that we feel very vulnerable about sharing. And hopefully we can just form a really nice supportive community around this. If you've watched to the end of this video, then I posted it, which at this point in time sitting here right now, I don't know if I'm gonna do or not. I know I'm filming it, but it's a big thing to post about this. Like I said in the beginning, my takeaway message from this is please get your smear test done. If you like this video and it was helpful for you, please give it a thumbs up. Make it easier for other people to find if they're searching for information because they're going through a similar thing. Share it with your friends if you know that it's going to be helpful to them. Thank you so much for watching everyone and I will see you in hopefully a more upbeat video.